line. Hello, by the way, to those who watch us uh, uh, asynchronously the lecture. All right. Um, and those who watch asynchronously, you can ask questions on Mattermost, by the way. You have this, uh, also this channel with uh, the TA team, and uh, we are here to answer questions. All right. Uh, so welcome back, everybody. Uh, we are going now to go to the next step. Now we know how to build very large uh, indices, can cost a lot of money. So now we are going to squeeze the, uh, the, uh, the, the data in order to fit more on less space. Right? So this is the index compression uh, lecture. So what have we seen so far? We've looked into Boolean retrieval. We have a set of documents as inputs. We are able to process queries that look like this with and, or, and not, and any conjunction of that. And we output a subset of the documents. We've seen that an efficient way of doing that is to build a standard inverted index. Standard because this is the, uh, the vanilla version, but as we saw, it can be extended with many bells and whistles, depending on what you're doing. Uh, we saw that this part right there can be organized with hash tables, with uh, B plus trees in order to, uh, to make it uh, efficient to look up. We've had additional bells and whistles to our system because we can have wildcard queries. We've looked into how to do that. We have spell correction, many ways, many ways to do spell corrections. We have phrase search with the extra indices, byword indices, for example, or positional indices and so on. Uh, which you recognize with these quotes in there with the, where the order here is actually important, right? So this is list of words, Simon. Okay, so we've looked, uh, especially for this one, into by words indices for the phrase search feature. We've looked into positional indices where you have this, we've talked about it in the last minute of the last lecture, the positional tokens, right? That you have uh, uh, right in there. So sorry, uh, positional postings here. Every one of these numbers is a positional posting. Um, and uh, that's it. So we have here, uh, yes, a trigram index. This is used for spell, spell correction. This is when we have the sliding windows of uh, K grams, right? Over the words that we use to retrieve the actual words that contain them. We looked into this way using BSBI to replace the term with term IDs because when we have all of these pairs flying around in memory during construction, it takes a lot of space. Um, we looked into BSBI, this tongue twister right there, uh, that uh, is a first primitive way of, of doing it. Then we looked into SPIMI, which is the improvement uh, that, that uh, directly creates here a, 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 standard inver a mini standard inverting index for every shaft of the input. Uh, then we looked into online index construction. So this is when the collection evolves dynamically and you need to uh, uh, keep the index up to date. So we looked into this auxiliary index in memory and then into this logarithmic merging, which is this very efficient way of going from quadratic to T log T, right? So uh, that's how we improved on it. And that's pretty much it. Uh, that's impressive, right? What we've already been doing so far, right? You have already learned uh, a lot about information retrieval. But this is not the end of it. We are not even halfway through the semester. So there are many, many other uh, uh, exciting things that we are going to be learning right now. So how do we compress stuff? Well, in order to compress stuff, we first need to understand the stuff we want to compress, right? So how do we understand the stuff we want to compress? Let's do a bit of data science then. Well, some very high level data science. We are going to look at the statistics of the term by analyzing real world data in order to understand better how these terms distribute and so on and so on. All right. So, um, the number of terms that I have is basically what there is on the left of, of, of my index, right? On the left of my standard inverted index, I have the terms. These terms didn't pop up out of nowhere. They were built from the initial collection, right? Then we build the terms. Now, a question that you might be asking yourself is, if the collection grows, maybe it doubles or it quadruples, how does my number of terms evolve? Does it double to? Does it quadruple? Does it do more than that? Does it do less than that? That's a big question, right? So in order to do that, we are going to start writing down formulas and try to do some, some uh, it's actually some kind of machine learning in the sense of linear, uh, uh, linear regression, right? So, so I not so down in details, I directly draw the curves, right? But you could almost consider it machine learning, very basic machine learning. But anyway, I need a few notations. And this is, again, a way to repeat what I've said at the end of the previous lecture. So n right there, this big n in the book as well, I think, um, is for the number of documents. 
It's how many books you have in your collection, how many web pages. And T is for the tokens. It's whatever is between two spaces in the original in the original document, right? It's also actually a positional posting. If you think about it, it's the same thing as a token. Why is it the same thing? Well, what is a positional posting? I told you it's a triple with the term, the documents, and the position. But if you have the document and the position, then you know exactly where it is in the input document, right? So it uniquely identifies the term. So for every positional posting, you have exactly one token that corresponds to it. So this is why you can consider that token and positional posting are synonymous, right? But usually when we just say posting, we mean non-positional posting. So this is why we make, we make the difference. So instead of saying positional postings, I tend to say token because it's just simpler. And instead of saying non-positional posting, I just say post, right? Okay, so that's T, the number of tokens, okay? So it's, you can consider very roughly it's the number of spaces that you have in your input collection. That's a, a proxy for that, an estimator. Uh, M in, is the number of terms. Again, that's what you have on the left of your standard inverted index. Uh, in the pre-processing, there is a fancy name for that that we also use called type, right? So the types are the groups of tokens that, that are basically uh, uh, conjugations of the same verb and so on and so on, right? Uh, but in the index, we don't call them types. We just use the word term for what we have on the left. All right, so what do I want to do now? I want to look at M versus N, right? This is M and this is N. So how do they compare? So this is here the number of uh, 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 the number of tokens, the number of terms. Oh yeah, by the way, just to make sure uh, that, that this is not confusing here. I said we are comparing the number of terms with the number of documents, but here I put the number of tokens. Um, it actually is more or less the same. If you, if you make a simplifying assumption that on average documents have more or less the same number of terms, then it doesn't really matter if you compare the number of terms to the number of documents or if you compare the number of terms to the number of tokens, right? So you could do it either way. Uh, but le okay, let's take the number of tokens, right? So let's just say I add books and I add the tokens in batches and that keeps increasing and increasing and increasing. So I have more and more and more tokens and more data coming in. And I look at the number of terms in my standard inverted index. How does it compare? Is it like this? Maybe it's linear, maybe it's hyperlinear, whatever we call it, quadratic, uh, exponential, oh my, exponential sounds scary. Uh, maybe it's less, maybe it's logarithmic, maybe it's square roots. Do you have any guesses? Logarithmic. Logarithmic is one guess, anybody else? Sublinear, I see in chat. Sublinear, yes. There's many ways to be sublinear, right? Logarithmic is one. Another logarithmic in chat, I see. Logarithmic or even less. Another chat. We have answer. a lot of logarithmic, right? Okay. So here's the solution. Actually, you can, or it could even be something hyperbolic, right? There could even be a max in there. You, you might also argue, okay, there's only so many words in it. Right. So maybe at some point there is a cap that it never exceeds. So that could even be something like a one over X mixture, right? That at some point is just uh, hitting the cap, right? But anyway, we love things linear, right? So of course the answer is not linear. You are correct that it's sublinear. However, maybe it's linear on a log log scale. What if I take a log log scale? Well, if you assume that it is linear on a log log scale, what's absolutely beautiful is that you can do a linear regression. You can just look at real world data, put the points in there and then, then attempt a linear regression and see if you find some line with an alpha and a beta that basically fits uh, uh, in there. It turns out, so you can try it like this, right? So just uh, this is the beta and this is the alpha, right? You know, like you do linear regression. Well, it turns out that corresponds, so this is log log, right? So if it's not log log, but the actual scale, this is what it means. It's basically some power, uh, some constant times the uh, uh, power of T. Uh, well, it turns out that if you attempt that, the, the linear regression on the log log scale, you do find the beta of one half. It, it's surprising that it's actually one half, right? Why, why almost exactly one half, right? It could have been anything between zero and one, right? But it turns out to be one half. In reality, what we observe, and that one half is on the log log scale. So if you take it to the actual M versus T, 
and then you are looking at the square root. So you see, we're not very far away with the, with the logarithm, right? But it's actually the square root with some constant right there that is between 30 and 100. But this is this is basically with from the alpha of the linear regression. Okay. So this is called uh, Heap's law, uh, if I correctly remember, H-E-A-P, Heap's law, uh, that the number of terms grows square rootedly with the number of tokens. And here you have a surprise because yeah, that's not capped by the number of words in the English language. In the real world, it's just the square root. And this is empirical. This is really just something that we observe, right? It didn't come from some theory or something. It's just that we tried the linear regression and this is what we found out. It turns out to be the square root. So that's the heap slope. Now there is something else that we like to look at is the distribution of the terms. What is the size of the positive list for every term? How does that distribute? So I actually tried on Wikipedia, I tried something. I, I, I took the, uh, the, the, the words, the occurrences of the words uh, in, uh, in Wikipedia and you see like V is extreme, it's almost a stop word here. Uh, sesquipedal, which is something from poetry, I think, uh, only seven occurrences. Germanium, uh, you, you see these are very fancy and specialist words. These are rather common words. But how does it distribute if I try to plot it like that, right? So here I have V and so on, and I try to sort them by decreasing frequency. Uh, well, if you do it with a lot of tokens, you get something that looks like that. So here it smells like one over X, right? Uh, and actually that's what it is because again, log log scale, linear regression works again like a charm. So you have actually a line here and what it gives you again, this A log plus B is actually when you do it a minus one. So it means that the minus one, so that's the inverse, this is a one over X curve. The frequency of the term, if you sort them by decreasing frequency is roughly some constant divided by the rank. One, one half, one third, one quarter, one fifth, one fifth. Uh, modulo some constant. This is, and here, you, if you're Swiss German, it's probably easier to pronounce, tip slow, right? So, uh, so uh, hip slow for the first one, we saw the square root and tip slow for the, the number of occurrences, the document frequency of the terms uh, in uh, decreasing order. Let's stop here with this beautiful data science discovery of hip slow and tip slow uh, for today, because I see that it's actually almost four. I just want to check that you've been following and then you'll be free to go to the exercise sessions. Uh, just, I need to open that. Okay, so tell me if you can confirm that since when I asked if you had questions, you didn't, that you've actually been following. So it was a bit more technical today, right? I went more in depth, uh, pushed you out of your comfort zone. Okay, very good. A bit more, 50%. Okay. Okay, so what that tells me is I need to slow down, to slow down slightly uh, in order to adapt. So this is why I'm asking you the question. I just want to adapt my pace. So when I see that here, it starts to be uh, distributed between 80 and 50, I would just slow down a bit, right? All right. So for those of you who are in the 50% to 79% bucket, please read the book. Again, this is the, an angle for what I'm telling you in the lecture, we'll give you another angle. If you have remaining questions, please either ask them on Mattermost or in the next lecture, we can start right away with any questions that you have. I just want to make sure that you're following absolutely everything uh, that I'm telling you, right? So read the book and prepare questions uh, so that we make sure you're following. All right, so thank you very much, uh, everybody. Thank you, Dan, for uh, moderating the lecture. Uh, I hope you enjoyed it and uh, enjoyed the exercise session. And I'll see you next week. Uh, I'll start with questions uh, and then we'll continue squeezing the index into less space. Thank you very much. Have a nice weekend. Goodbye. <laughs>